This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Morris Herlihy has a bachelor's degree in math from Harvard and a <coughs> PhD in computer science from MIT. He is a, was a professor at Carnegie Mellon and also worked on the research team at DEC. Currently, he is a professor at Brown University and he is also a fellow of the ACM. He's going to be talking today about multiprocessor synchronization. Specifically, um, using synchronization techniques like locks is not scaling well. And so he has a method that he's going to discuss, which is using transactional memory. So the th different threads synchronize using optimistic memory <coughs> transactions. And the um, details of this he'll be describing to you. If you're not familiar with synchronization or other things, sometimes the student feedback is that they're not following the talks. Um, so please feel free to ask questions if something isn't making sense. And in general, uh, enjoy the talk. Please welcome Morris Herlihy. Thank you. So like uh, most uh, theoreticians, I like to uh, start out my talks with the obligatory Moore's Law uh, slide. So I think uh, everybody probably is aware of this. But uh, what happened uh, a few years ago, uh, Intel basically gave up trying to make uh, Pentiums run faster. Uh, they didn't, uh, at the time they wouldn't say why this was, but uh, the word on the street was they were overheating. You know, kind of like my old 1975 Volvo, if you press on the gas, it gets hotter but it doesn't go any faster. <laughs> and that, that's kind of what they were uh, running into. And so the um, one side effect of this is that research in uh, concurrency and multiprocessors, which had always been respected but never taken seriously, suddenly uh, became important because it, it became true that there was no way to avoid having to deal with the parallelism. And that's the um, focus of, uh, of my talk uh, today. So um, the sort of the vulgar and the unlettered think that um, Moore's Law says that everything gets faster. But in fact, it just means that everything gets smaller. And so the question is, uh, what are we going to do with all those extra transistors? Well, if you Google uh, multicore, uh, at least a few weeks ago, you get uh, these, this sort of thing. And what it says is that all of the uh, major manufacturers are moving to a multicore architecture. Multicore, by the way, means that you put more than one copy of a, a processor on a, uh, on a chip. Now, uh, one question is, so why do we care? So um, part of the problem is that uh, imagine that you're a large uh, monopolistic uh, company that makes a lot of its uh, money by uh, convincing people to upgrade, you know, like Starbucks. <laughs> And uh, it, every year, you ca in the, in, it used to be the case that every year you could uh, put in aggressive new features. And the fact that it, uh, it was slower didn't matter because in six months, the processors would have speed up so that you wouldn't notice it anymore. But now that those days are gone, uh, there's a real problem. Uh, how are you going to be able to put new features in to get people to buy upgrades when uh, the clock speeds don't, uh, don't improve? The only way to, uh, in some sense, harness these uh, advances in technology is uh, simply to make your uh, program more and more parallel. And uh, this, in fact, is uh, very hard uh, to do. Question? Yes? Why twice and not say 10 times? Oh, uh, I think I had to, uh, you know, Moore's Law usually says over some period of time uh, gets twice as, uh, you know, think of it as, as a constant factor. Now, what I'm going to claim is the problem is that today, so multicore is going to give us cheap threads. And they're going to be able to uh, communicate uh, quickly. But uh, I claim that given today's uh, hardware architectures and today's software methodologies, we don't know what to do with them. That uh, today, today's uh, software practice is uh, based on uh, programming methodologies that are not inherently not, not uh, scalable. And that today's hardware also provides poor support for scalable synchronization. 
and the pretty much the standard uh, way to uh, do synchronization is a uh, locking. So uh, you want to rummage around a share of the data structure, uh, temporarily violate its invariance, uh, you know, disassemble the engine and then put it back, back together again. Uh, what you do is you put a lock on it. Uh, and that lock guarantees that nobody else can uh, get in there and uh, see these temporary inconsistencies that you're introducing. And this is something that uh, we teach our undergraduates in operating systems classes uh, and, and so on. Now, uh, you can use locks in a number of styles. So one way to uh, do this is to put a big lock on your entire uh, operating system kernel, or a big lock on your entire file system. Now, this has the advantage that it's basically idiot-proof, but has the disadvantage that, of course, you cannot uh, increase your concurrency. So it used to be that there was a whole uh, uh, part of the Solaris kernel that was protected by a bit that was originally part of the control word for some device that is long uh, uh, vanished. And uh, everybody knew that you were safe if you acquired this, uh, this lock. And uh, I think that that's all been uh, fixed uh, since then. But for a while, people were just too scared of what was going on there to uh, try to fix it until it became uh, too much of a, uh, of a burden. So an alternative is to say, well, instead of putting one big lock on uh, the whole um, program, Let's put lots of little locks scattered around, and you only take the ones that you need. And this means uh, that you can get more concurrency, because if you have two activities that don't actually interfere with each other, they can run in parallel. And it seems like a good idea, but in fact, uh, I'm going to argue that it, it's actually a terrible idea. So um, there's a whole list of reasons why uh, fine grain locking uh, doesn't uh, scale. And <coughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go through each one of these um, uh, uh, reasons and then uh, propose a, a kind of an alternative. Now the first uh, observation is that locking isn't robust. You know, if you ever had a toddler that uh, wandered into the bathroom, uh, locked uh, herself in and then fell asleep, you know, you know that what happens is that, that uh, gets in the way of a throughput. So if a thread acquires a lock and then gets swapped out, then, you know, it's uh, sand in the stopwatch. Nobody else can make any uh, progress. Now curiously, this is the least of the problems with locking. Another problem with locking is that it relies on conventions. So the relationship between the bit in memory that represents the lock and the bits scattered throughout memory that represent the object exists only in the mind of the programmer, you know, by, by uh, convention. And, you know, there are, you know, languages like Java and C Sharp have sort of tried to fix this by associating locks with objects, but uh, that really doesn't uh, uh, work in any uh, non-trivial uh, cases. And uh, evidence for this is here is an actual um, quote from uh, the Linux uh, kernel. Now, I don't know what this means either, but uh, you can tell by reading it uh, that there are, will be fearsome consequences for uh, not understanding it. And <laughs> the, uh, you, know, you know, this is not the basis for a uh, you know, scalable, sustainable uh, software development uh, methodology. Um, the next point I'm going to make is hard to quantify, but uh, you sort of know it when you see it, and that is that locking is hard to use. Now, as an academic, I've discovered that nobody uh, minds if I give the same lectures year after year, but I better not give the same homework year after year. So I'm a, an avid collector of good homework problems. And so I came up with this uh, homework problem uh, a few years ago and uh, naively thought it would be uh, fairly easy, and uh, I think my uh, teaching rating hit an all-time low. Uh, you know, in, in response to uh, you know, what happened when I signed this problem. So the problem is I want to um, devise a double-ended queue. That is a queue where I can end queue on the right side, DQ on the right side, end queue on the left side, DQ on the left side. And it has to work concurrently. And what I want is I want to guarantee that I can, uh, that one thread can operate on one end of the queue and another thread can operate on the other end of the queue without interference as long as the uh, queue is big enough. Because after all, if the queue is big enough, then they're working on uh, you know, different ends of it. There's no logical reason why they should uh, block uh, one another. Uh, but on the other hand, if the queue is uh, small, for example, it's empty, it only has one uh, element in it, then of course the uh, two had better uh, 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 coordinate with one another to decide who gets the last uh, queue element. And so um, your assignment is to think about how you would do this kind of synchronization 
using, uh, using locks. You know, so you can just imagine you, you put a padlock on uh, each uh, object and uh, nobody can uh, use that object while you have it a padlock. And you know, while I'm, for the next couple of slides while I'm talking about this, just sort of think about this in the back of your head, you know, the different kinds of approaches that you would uh, take to, to doing this. So um, one thing is you can put one lock on the entire queue and again, uh, that's idiot proof, but it doesn't give you any concurrency. So it violates the requirement that we get uh, concurrency when the queue is, uh, has lots of stuff in it. Uh, you can put locks at each end. You could have a right hand lock and a left hand lock. And uh, so when I want to do something at the right hand end of the queue, I acquire the right hand lock. Uh, but what if there's only one element in the queue? Well, just to be sure, I better go over and after I acquire the right hand lock, I better go over and maybe acquire the left hand lock afterwards. But then if someone else is doing the same thing in the other order, you get a deadlock. So um, this is typically the approach that my uh, uh, unhappy undergraduates uh, took when I gave them this. Uh, and you know, most of them recognized there was a deadlock there, so they put in back offs, they put in all kinds of, uh, and things get very complicated very quickly. You know, and, and you, you can imagine that's, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's not the uh, direction you want to go in. Um, as an aside, I said that waking a block dequeures, you know, what do you do if the queue is empty? Uh, that's harder than it uh, looks, you know, using standard weight and signal um, uh, kinds of uh, methodologies. I won't say much more about that, but that's an, an interesting uh, topic in and of itself. Okay, so uh, what I claim is that if you come up with a nice clean solution to this problem, that that would be a publishable result. You know, maybe not a publishable result in like a first class uh, uh, conference, but you know, a pretty good, uh, you know, sort of middle level uh, conference. And the reason I think so is because a, um, <laughs> a, pa a, a paper uh, that actually uh, that didn't solve this exact problem, but uh, you can be trivially transformed into what's something that solves this problem, was published in a, a very good uh, conference by uh, two uh, you know, very distinguished uh, people back in 1996. So the, a second solution to this probably wouldn't be as famous, but uh, would still uh, be, uh, be pretty interesting. So the point I'm leading up to is, um, you know, what good is a methodology where a statement that is simple enough that uh, you can explain it to a high school student where a solution to that is a publishable result? Now, you know, mathematicians, people who do number theory, uh, gloat over the notion that they can come up with uh, statements that, are, uh, that, uh, that anybody who's taken arithmetic can understand. And then it takes them centuries to uh, solve them. And they view this as evidence that the field is really, really profound. You know, and uh, the mathematicians may be uh, correct, but uh, you know, we're you know, computer scientists and engineers, not mathematicians, and it, it should, we should be embarrassed that uh, something uh, so simple to state would be viewed as a, uh, a, a solution to such a simple problem would be viewed as uh, uh, publishable. Okay, um, so the um, next thing that I'm gonna talk about is in fact what I think is the most compelling reason why um, lock-based uh, synchronization isn't uh, uh, scalable, and that is <coughs> that it's not composable. You can't put um, pieces together. Now, the very first thing that we teach uh, people in software engineering classes is that if you need to take a square root, you don't need to write your own uh, loops that uh, you know, uh, generate convergent series. You know, there's a library package called square root that you can call. And you can compose square root uh, anywhere you want. You can compose square root with other things, and you can build up hierarchies of abstractions. And uh, what I'm going to insist here is that uh, we cannot do even this elementary kind of composition using uh, lock-based uh, synchronization. So imagine I want to build a concurrent hash table, and I want to add um, an item into the table. Well, the, the protocol here is pretty simple. So I have to lock the table before I put the item in. You know, this way, uh, you know, this prevents uh, you know someone else from uh, you know stepping on uh, kind of internal da data structures. So that's very good. So uh, that was so much fun. I want to do it twice. Now I wanted what I want to do is I want to remove something from one hash table and insert it in another hash table. And naturally, I want to do this atomically, so that it, the item appears either in one table or in the other table. Uh, you don't see any duplicates, and you never see it. Uh, as, uh, as being missing. So um, I want to take this delete T1, I want to delete item from T1, insert it into T2. Now the, uh, with a little bit of thought, you can see the protocol is you have to lock T2 first, 
then you can lock T1, and then you can move uh, the, uh, the items. Um, but uh, how, but how would you do this, say, using a uh, language like Java, where the locks are acquired once you call the method? Well, the answer is that you can't, because if I call the method, it acquires the lock. There's no way I can lock T2 before, before I operate on T1. So the only alternative is you have to export the locking and unlocking. But at that point, uh, you've destroyed any hope of uh, kind of modularity or robustness, because now the consistency of your data structures relies on the kindness of strangers. Everyone who uses this had better use it correctly. And as you can see, it's, you know, it's, it's not, uh, you know, you don't want your average, you know, visual basic programmer, uh, you know, re reasoning about this kind of uh, uh, stuff. <laughs> you know, you know, not that I have anything as visual basic. Uh, well, the, uh, you could do that, but it's, but it's not really, you'd have to write a method that would uh, do this, but your components would still have to export their, uh, their locks. So sure, I could write a procedure that says lock T2 and then lock T1, but T1 would still have to export its locks to the outside world. You know, there, there isn't a, usually any way for me to reach into uh, T2 and uh, lock it uh, without calling a, its, uh, its methods. So, so, so the difficulty really is that, um, you know, what kind of uh, synchronization uh, does each level export to the higher level of the, um, of the hierarchy? Okay, so um, everyone who works in uh, computer systems knows that all of the really good ideas in systems were developed by uh, people working in databases in the 70s and uh, 80s. Now, uh, fortunately, they didn't publish in any known Indo-European language. You know, they were, <laughs> you know, they were, you know, you know IPLing the uh, DDR and uh, you know stuff like that. You know, it was all uh, a lot of it was done in IBM, and they, they had their own set of acronyms that nobody understood. So you can make an entire career out of uh, stealing uh, these ideas and uh, recycling them in a new uh, context. So the idea that we're going to steal here is the notion of an atomic uh, transaction. Uh, this is a very simple idea. It says you say begin transaction, you do a bunch of stuff, you say commit transaction, and if, uh, the, if everything is okay, then everything you did in between the begin and the end appears to happen atomically. You know, there's no interleaving with other uh, transactions. It happens instantaneously. And <coughs> the interesting thing here is that, um, you know, these, these things compose. Now, um, I have an alternate set of slides where I actually, you know, walk through that uh, sadistic homework problem and show you how to do it with transactions. But uh, rather than uh, doing, uh, uh, doing that, you know, you can think about how, you, how that would be because it's not too hard to reconstruct it. I'm going to talk about uh, some, you know, very recent uh, kind of half-baked work that we've been doing uh, looking at some of the problems that arise in transaction model of synchronization. Now, I want to emphasize that uh, just saying that we're going to replace locking with transactions doesn't mean we can all go home. You know, there's still lots and lots of uh, unsettled uh, questions. You know, there's uh, research groups uh, here working hard on uh, fixing uh, uh, some of those uh, issues. And so what I want to do is, is kind of pick one of these uh, issues and uh, talk about them. So um, one question is, so what are efficient algorithms and data structures for this model? So I claim that uh, you need to uh, rethink uh, the way you design uh, concurrent data structures if you're working in a, a transactional model. So the usual way, so the way the databases would do synchronization is uh, your transaction collects a read set and a write set. The read set is everything it read, and the write set is everything it wrote. <coughs> and if you have another transaction whose uh, read and write sets intersect yours, so it's okay if the read sets intersect, but if anything intersects a right set, then you have a synchronization conflict, and either one transaction has to wait for the other to uh, finish, or if they go ahead optimistically, then one of them has to uh, roll back and, uh, and retry. But uh, all of these uh, classical um, transactional synchronization um, approaches are based on read and write. <laughs> read, read and write. Um, uh, sets. Now, the problem with read and write sets is in a uh, database, you don't really care much about fine grained concurrency. You, you care about coarse grained concurrency. But when we're talking about uh, multi core processors and shared memory and things like that, we do care a lot about fine grained concurrency because we're dealing on uh, rather different scales. Databases are also uh, typically uh, I.O. bound, 
but uh, you know, we're not uh, I.O. bound at all in the, in the multiprocessor world. So let me give you a uh, problem example. So a, a, a skew heap is a, a very simple uh, data structure where you know, it, it's a heap, it's a tree. Uh, every uh, node in the tree has a, a, a value that's uh, less than everything uh, below it. Now, um, skew heaps have this interesting uh, algorithm where if I want to insert something in the uh, a tree, uh, what I do is I, each time I visit a node, I rotate the children. And then I always go down the, uh, the, you know, the right-hand side. And this is a um, sort of sta a classical um, self-adjusting uh, uh, data structure. Uh, I think it was the Slater and Tarjan. The uh, interesting thing about it, unlike things like uh, you know, red-black trees or most kinds of heaps, you never need to do any uh, global rebalancing because you're always doing uh, these little uh, cumulative uh, adjustments. And you can show that it has good amortized uh, performance. You know, it, it's uh, within some constant factor of, uh, what it, of, um, of optimal. And uh, there's an interesting aspect here that, you know, what I've described so far is a sequential data structure, but you can turn this into a concurrent data structure fairly easily. And what you do is you can uh, basically do kind of hand over hand locking. So you lock the parent node, you rotate the children, you lock the child, and then you release the parent. And by working your way down the uh, uh, tree, this is called lock, lock uh, coupling, uh, you can get concurrency because you can have a number of transactions traversing the tree at the uh, same time. And you know, th this is with, uh, uh, sorry, not, not uh, transactions, the number of threads uh, traversing the tree at the same time. Now, what happens if you try to do this in the transactional model? Well, everything falls apart. So what happens is every transaction that visits the skew heap, the first thing it does is it rotates the children. But that's a right uh, uh, update. And so that means that uh, anyone else who visits the tree, the first thing they try to do is rotate the, uh, the root. And that's a right-right conflict. And either they, uh, you know, one locks the other one out or they end up uh, having to abort and roll back when the, you discover the uh, conflict uh, later on. So the problem here is that I've come up, I've found a kind of standard algorithm that uh, works fine using locks. Uh, but doesn't uh, work on kind of standard read-write synchronization-based transactional models. And uh, this is uh, distressing because, you know, I can argue that uh, the transactional model will give you more understandable code because you just take the sequential program and you decorate it with beginning transaction and you don't need to uh, re reason about locks. On the other hand, uh, the performance isn't going to uh, be uh, very good at all. And uh, what we would like is a way of, um, of fixing this. Okay, and um, there have been a number of proposals that address this uh, very problem. And I'm going to uh, describe my favorite uh, proposal and uh, vilify uh, the others. And the basic premise that I want to um, uh, make is that the heart of the problem here is that existing transactional memory systems uh, don't distinguish between thread level synchronization you know, that is low level, uh, you know, doing compare and swaps and um, things like that. And high level transactional synchronization, saying that transactions aren't supposed to observe one another's effects uh, and, and so on. And I claim that even the ones that claim to make this distinction don't, or at least they don't do it right. And uh, it's clear that mixing these levels, at least it's clear to me, that mixing these two uh, levels is the cause of the lack of concurrency in uh, data structures like the skew heap and other, you know, less exotic things like uh, hash tables uh, and so on. Okay, so um, what I'm going to describe is uh, work that, uh, very preliminary work that I'm doing with uh, one of my students. Uh, this is a methodology that we call transactional boosting. So what we do is we want to take uh, highly concurrent uh, objects that don't know anything about transactions. You know, they just do each, uh, each individual operation appears to happen instantaneously. And I'm going to turn it into a highly concurrent transactional object. And uh, what I want to say is that if I have two transactions that don't logically interfere with one another, then uh, they can uh, proceed concurrently at the same kind of granularity of synchronization as the original, original non-transactional object. So that means that if your base object, say, is lock-free, obstruction-free, or uses fi very fine-grained uh, locking, then so do the transactions. And this is something that uh, pretty much nobody else uh, does. 
So um, first I should uh, describe what a uh, transactional object is. So here's a schematic picture of a transactional uh, queue, you know, with a bunch of uh, elements in it. And uh, there are the operations, the here are NQ and DQ operations. Uh, unlike sequential operations, they have a duration in time. So you think, in the sequential world, you think I uh, DQ something from a queue, you can think of it as happening instantaneously, you know, if you're not watching the wall clock. But in the current system, it's uh, clear that operations overlap. So here we have two NQs that uh, both uh, overlap uh, completely. Then uh, the uh, red thread does a DQ, and then the blue thread uh, does a DQ. And uh, the question is, so if I tell you this is a concurrent FIFO queue, and it did this, uh, would you say this was uh, correct or not? Was, is this correct uh, FIFO behavior? Now the tricky thing here is FIFO, first in, first out, uh, mean, you know, refers to non-overlapping operations. What does it mean for a uh, queue where operations can overlap? What does it mean to be first? So the uh, solution, you know, fairly standard uh, answer, is a property called linearizability, which says that each operation appears to take place at some instant between when it was called and when it returned. So the answer is that uh, this is uh, a linearizable implementation because if each of those operations happened at the instance uh, marked here, then that is a FIFO queue. So the idea here is that uh, somewhere underneath the machinery makes it happen instantaneously, but uh, all you see is kind of a delay. You know, it's like correspondence of chess. You know, you mail a letter, you know, something happens atomically, you, you, the uh, a response uh, comes back. So this is our model of thread level synchronization. So you start out with a linearizable object, and what I'm going to tell you is how to uh, boost it into a transactional object. Now, um, again, I should mention that the techniques I'm going to use here is each one of these individual techniques is taken uh, from uh, prior uh, literature. But what's new, interesting and new here is the combination of these things as applied to uh, uh, transactional memory, to multiprocessor synchronization rather than uh, uh, database synchronization. So um, now one interesting thing here is that there's been a lot of activity, a lot of research activity in uh, building highly concurrent linearizable objects. So uh, there's this uh, java-util.concurrent package, which uh, with each release has uh, more and more um, uh, different kinds of uh, things, but they have you know, things like uh, concurrent uh, sets, hash tables, heaps, uh, queues, stacks, the whole, all these container uh, things. Uh, there's uh, you know, large numbers of uh, publications and conferences about improving these things, uh, doing uh, you know, all kinds of activities. So there's a lot of um, work going on here. There's also a lot of interest in uh, different kinds of uh, progress guarantees. So you can implement some of these things without using locks, you know, non-blocking synchronization. Uh, not, this comes in different flavors, lock-free, weight-free, obstruction-free. I you know, won't uh, go into that in uh, detail. Or you can do it with uh, very fine-grained locks, kind of like the uh, uh, skew heap uh, implementation that, uh, that I described. But the point that I want to make here is that there, there's an enormous uh, collection of algorithms that people have worked on. And uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, basically exploit these for transactional synchronization. I don't want to have to rethink uh, uh, concurrent, uh, concurrent um, skip lists, for example, each time I want to put one in a, a transaction. So um, what we're going to do here is we're going to start out with a uh, linearizable base object that's not transaction aware, uh, but is linearizable. So it, you know, I can call all the concurrent operations I want, and internally it will make sure that they uh, behave correctly but it doesn't know anything about uh, transactions. Then I'm going to give a, a transactional wrapper, uh, which basically delays or admits transaction calls, independently of the uh, low level, and it uh, undoes, it handles uh, undoing effects of transactions abort. So for example, a transaction could modify an object, uh, go somewhere else, uh, run into a synchronization conflict elsewhere and abort, then I have to revisit the object I visited and uh, undo its effects. So until a transaction commits, you always need to be able to undo its effects. But the interesting thing here is because we're treating the base object as a black box, we can exploit all of this uh, wonderful work that other people have done. And uh, you know, if they did a highly concurrent uh, B tree, then we can write a highly concurrent uh, transactional B tree. So this is kind of the picture of a um, linearizable object. All these uh, threads come in, and they concurrently uh, traverse the object and uh, do what they want. 
and you know this there's an object kind of object boundary and operations you know method calls that provide kind of the abstract interface then uh, there's all the internal machinery now the way transactional boosting works is um, we're going to put this uh, transactional level uh, wrapper where what we're going to do is we're going to basically st stop and say well you know you can't go in there now because of not because there's any problem with the thread level synchronization but because you're about to do something that would convey information to another uncommitted transaction and th therefore violating atomicity and so what we want what we want to do here is figure out what's the right thing to put at the uh, transactional uh, level so one thing that again I want to emphasize here that there is you know clean distinction between uh, these uh, these two levels so uh, the transactional uh, level might say well these two uh, transactions can go ahead because uh, they don't interfere and I'll define interference uh, in a minute but uh, the blue transaction has to await uh, until the others commit. And then uh, when the other two clear out, then uh, we can allow the blue uh, transaction to, uh, to proceed. So um, sounds like magic. So what's the catch? So the catch here is that uh, we only allow method calls to proceed in parallel if they commute with one another. So commutativity means that uh, you can apply these two operations in either order, and you get back the same answer in each order and you get the same final state. You, know, you can define this formally, but uh, you know, I think you know what I mean. Uh, we'll see that there are some subtleties in uh, defining exact when things actually do and don't uh, uh, commute. And also, each call has to have an inverse. And the meaning of an inverse is that if I do operation P, and then I immediately do operation P inverse, then I get back the same state that I had uh, before. You know, so again, uh, there's some subtleties here, but you know, your intuition uh, pretty much covers uh, most of the, uh, the cases. <coughs> so again, um, once you have, if, if you understand the commutativity and you have the inverses, then you can treat the object as a black box. You don't need to know how it works in order to uh, do this uh, transactional uh, uh, boosting. Moreover, we're synchronizing at kind of an abstract level, not a physical level. So that means that we don't need to keep track of read and write sets. So if I traverse a huge um, a skip list and touch the thousands of memory locations, I only need one log entry. You know, it's, it's not proportional to the amount of uh, low-level uh, stuff uh, that, uh, that I'm uh, doing. And uh, this is going to be important later. It's clear how to use this correctly. Again, I haven't given you a formal definition of anything, but trust me, uh, it's uh, possible. Uh, my student is working on it as we uh, speak. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to argue that uh, some of the uh, alternatives uh, don't have the same kind of, uh, you know, moral clarity. Okay, so, <coughs> um, so the runtime structure just blocks non-commuting calls. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some examples of how you can do this. Uh, you log the calls and results in a thread local uh, <coughs> log. If um, you need to know the results of a call in order to figure out what the inverse is supposed to be. You know, that's one of the uh, subtleties. And then if a transaction aborts, then all you do is you, uh, you know, go through the uh, log and apply the inverses uh, in uh, uh, reverse order. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give you uh, some s simple examples. I'm going to give you three examples uh, of increasing uh, uh, sophistication. So uh, let's say I want to have a set. So a set object, uh, I, I can add x to a set using inverse call. Inverse, or, or rather, add returns true if I change the set. So if x is already in the set, it doesn't change it, but it returns false and says I didn't modify anything. Similarly for remove, and then a contains just tests a measurement. Now each operation here uh, returns a Boolean saying whether it modified the object, and that's, uh, that's important. So inverses. Uh, inverses are pretty, um, uh, pretty straightforward. So if I add 100, and it says, yes, I uh, just modified the set, then the inverse is remove 100. If I, it says add 100 and it comes back and says it was already there, then the inverse is a no-op. I don't have to do anything to undo it. And uh, similarly for uh, reverse. So the interesting thing here is that the set uh, pr naturally provides its own uh, inverses. And in fact, if you go to the uh, you know, Java set collections, uh, they all, uh, you know, uh, just about everything has an inverse. Uh, commutativity is uh, also fairly simple. Um, if adding uh, 100 commutes with adding 200 because uh, whether, it was, whether each argument was there or not uh, is unaffected by the other and the same, you get the same uh, final uh, state. 
So here we're determining commutativity based on uh, method uh, calls and arguments. So um, what we did was we took this uh, concurrent skip list uh, set from the Java uh, library. It's a lock-free implementation, uh, horrendously uh, complicated, uh, you know, very clever. You know, Doug Lee um, uh, did it. Uh, just to show that we really can treat things like a black box. And it provides its own inverses, so uh, we don't have to uh, do anything uh, particularly um, uh, clever here. And uh, we implemented it in something called uh, DSTM2, which is a Java-based software transactional uh, memory, which you can download uh, from uh, Sun. But actually, don't download the Sun version. You can get a, a more recent one uh, from me. And it has the ability to, uh, you can register commit and abort handlers, which is where, you know, where we uh, you know, put our logs and uh, things. And so here is the actual code, say, for the insert method. You know, this is every, uh, you know, all the code uh, there is. I uh, don't expect you to parse this. Uh, I expect you to uh, look at the number of characters and, and be impressed. You know, all you do is you, uh, you lock the key. In this case, it's just a, an array of uh, 32 locks which we hash uh, into. Then uh, you know when you return from this call that there is no concurrent uh, calls that are affecting the same element. There may be concurrent calls, but there are different elements. But uh, the, you know, we're not worried about that kind of level of synchronization because that's already handled by the low-level uh, linearizable object uh, at no charge. So then we call the actual uh, method, and then we take the result, and we say, well, if the set was actually modified, then I'm going to log this uh, call because I, I have a non-trivial inverse. And what's the non-trivial inverse? Well, it uh, just removes the, um, the set. And you know, again, this is all very elementary and uses some you know, uh, somewhat arcane uh, Java syntax. But you know, it's just you know, extremely simple. You know, it's not, uh, not rocket science. Does that add 100? Can you just add 100? Uh, add 100? No, it doesn't. The, uh, if you can take into account the uh, response, then add 100, it was already there. Commutes with add 100, it was already there. But uh, none of the other uh, possibilities uh, commute. OK, so uh, the next thing, uh, next example is uh, concurrent uh, heap. So uh, here, instead of taking something from the Java library, uh, there's a uh, concurrent heap that was uh, you know, published by a bunch of people at uh, Rochester uh, back in 1995, which uses fine-grained locks. It's uh, a little bit more sophisticated and clever than the skew heap uh, that I showed you uh, before. Uh, the interesting thing here is I didn't, uh, the paper doesn't describe inverses. So this is a good case study of how to add inverses to something that doesn't have it. And we're going to be able to exploit the results of a call when, when uh, deciding uh, commut commutativity. And I'll show you how to, uh, uh, how to do that. So um, we have two uh, methods. Uh, add, you can add a value to a heap. And uh, you can have uh, duplicates. And remove min uh, returns and removes the least element in the heap. You know, again, this is some kind of standard uh, uh, data structures. Now, the problem here is that um, add uh, doesn't provide any inverse. You know, you can remove the minimum element, but you can't re remove a, or a, a particularly requested element. And if you think about how heaps are implemented, it's not obvious if I say remove x, you know, if there's a, a way to implement that without uh, sort of doing a linear scan through the entire array. Uh, not to mention problems of synchronization. How do you do a linear scan uh, when things are being inserted and removed uh, concurrently? So that would seem to be kind of troublesome. But fortunately, we, we, we can define an inverse for add without writing a remove uh, method, uh, as long as we're not squeamish. So uh, you know, here's a typical uh, heap. What we're going to do is I'm going to just add a deleted bit to each node. And I'm going to uh, lazily delete things. So if I want to delete something from the node, then I set the bit to true. And then I just sort of uh, lazily uh, pick, I have remove min uh, lazily throw out uh, things that have been marked as uh, deleted. <coughs> And if you work it out, what happens is that the lazy deletion has an amortized cost uh, logarithmic in the uh, size of the uh, heap, same as insert uh, and, and so on. And if you did uh, read-write uh, tracking, uh, you would also have modified or read a logarithmic number of nodes. So uh, the amortized complexity is the same as, uh, as you would expect. So um, we, we change add so that it returns a reference to the heap node where your object is. Uh, add inverse is constant time, just sets the deleted bit. And then remove min, uh, if, it, if it removes something, it looks at it and says, oh, wait, this is deleted. It throws it out and then uh, does it again. So the, the point here is that uh, 
adding inverses to um, uh, methods is uh, easier than it looks. And remember, this is still not transaction aware in any uh, mechanical sense because this is just another uh, linearizable uh, method call with a slightly weird uh, interface. Commutativity. So add calls that commute with each other. Uh, interesting thing here is that removement that returns x commutes with an add call that uh, inserts uh, something uh, larger. You know, so removement removes the minimum thing, and if somebody's inserting something larger, then it doesn't matter what order they happen in, right? So that says that uh, we can now define commutativity uh, depending on uh, methods, arguments, and uh, also uh, the results of uh, calls. Is that even true if it's empty? Uh, empty is sort of a boundary case. So I, I, I haven't told you what happens if it's empty. So you know, it maybe it returns an all or throws an exception. Uh, but that's something that, you know, there are a couple choices you could make there. Uh, good question. So uh, the answer is that uh, you don't know the return value at the time you give the lock. So I come in and I say, I want permission to uh, do an add. And it says, well, I can't, I, I, there, there's a removement going on. And I don't know whether your add uh, value uh, conflicts with it or not. So what happens is you have to wait for the add to complete. So what, what it is is uh, you sort of uh, lock down the entire uh, object while the uh, movement is going on. As soon as it comes back, you say, okay, well, this was the value it returned, and now well, you can allow others to go through. So it's a, uh, so the idea here is we're going to have a write lock with a target uh, value. Uh, remove min, uh, when it comes in, it, it says uh, I'm going to have a write lock with a positive infinity, meaning that every possible add uh, uh, conflicts temporarily. When I find out what the return value is, I downgrade the target to the result value. So you have a brief window with no concurrency, but uh, you know, thereafter you can have all the uh, thread level concurrency that um, you, you can logically have. Okay, so a final example. Oops. That wasn't, this is what happens when you cut and paste things and uh, forget that there's animation uh, glued, glued to it. So pretend that didn't happen. So a lot of, uh, so I've been working on uh, some projects looking at uh, synchronization in um, embedded systems. And embedded systems do a lot of pipelining. So the question is, uh, we would like to um, set up uh, transactional systems that pipeline uh, stuff. And uh, this raises some interesting uh, questions about uh, conditional synchronization. For example, uh, we, we, need, we want to put buffers in between each of the stages so that if one of them is running a little faster or a little slower than the other, then uh, they can uh, keep, uh, keep going. Uh, nevertheless, if uh, they get too far out of a sync, we want the a consumer to block if the buffer is full and a producer to block, no, sorry, the consumer to block if the buffer is empty and the producer to block if the uh, buffer is uh, full. And this has to play well with the transactional uh, machinery. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, another uh, uh, Java um, interface, a, a blocking queue, which has uh, a, a method that says offer, which puts the value at the end of the queue and blocks if the queue is full and a, a take, which uh, does the other thing, it blocks if the queue is, uh, is empty. You know, this is a, um, so inver what about inverses? So the blocking queue doesn't have inverses, but fortunately there's a blocking double-ended queue, which we're going to use in its place, which does have uh, all the inverses, and uh, they, you know, it does all the, um, all the right things. Um, commutativity says, well, offer x, so putting something in the queue commutes with taking something out of the queue if the queue is not empty. And what that means is now we can say, well, commutativity depends on not just the method names uh, but, uh, and the arguments and the results, but now the object state matters. So commutativity uh, depends on whether the uh, buffer is uh, full or, or empty. So that's yet another uh, place where we can mine some, uh, some uh, concurrency. And the device that uh, we use to do this is something called a transactional semaphore. You know, a very uh, straightforward adaptation of uh, an even older idea that uh, where, you know, a semaphore is a counter. Uh, if you, you can increment the uh, counter or you can decrement the counter. If you try to decrement the counter uh, to a value below zero, then you block until it um, uh, becomes uh, non-zero. In a transactional world, uh, what you do is you say, well, the implement actually happens when the transaction commits. Uh, decrement happens right away and it blocks on zero and if you decrement it and you abort then you go back and, and increment it 
and this is easy to do with uh, commit and abort handlers. But it also means that uh, we can use uh, the transactional semaphores to, uh, you know, to, to uh, synchronize the uh, bounded, uh, bounded queue. So uh, experiments showing that this uh, uh, performs really well, like I said, my student is still working on that. So, uh, you know, we don't have any, uh, you know, all the numbers we have right now are kind of flaky and uh, suspect for uh, various reasons. But um, pretty much what seems to be emerging is that uh, if you do, you know, just a little bit of uh, clever locking, like locking on keys, then uh, it's hugely more efficient than uh, any kind of read-write-based uh, synchronization. That uh, the fancy stuff that I showed you uh, where you use the object state and the uh, return values, uh, it turns out for really short transactions it's not worth it because the overhead of doing all of that stuff uh, swamps the uh, increase the concurrency that you get. If you have really long transactions, uh, then it starts to uh, look better. But uh, we're not quite sure right, right now whether the cutoff is uh, reasonable or not. You know, so um, you know, we'll stay tuned. Uh, as soon as we write the paper, we'll, uh, we'll know. Now, um, you know, I promised I would uh, vilify and ridicule the other ways of addressing this problem. So there's something called open and nested uh, transactions, which are uh, very popular in uh, uh, this area. Now, start out with the idea of nested transactions, which are a good idea. The idea is I'm running a transaction, and I can sort of stop and take a checkpoint and do a nested transaction. And that nested transaction can commit or abort independently of its parent. Well, not, not totally independently. If the nested transaction uh, commits, then it releases results to its parent. If the nested transaction aborts, it's rolled back, but its parent can, can retry, for example. And uh, this is a way of getting fault tolerance, certain amount of modularity, and, and so on. Now, one way to address this uh, problem of having too, much, uh, too many false conflicts with read-write synchronization is something called open nested transactions. And the idea here is you start a nested transaction, and when it commits, it releases its results to everyone. So this is not the same as modifying the linearizable object in place, which is not done under transaction. This is a real transaction. It's just that when you get to the commit point, it actually installs its changes uh, so that everyone can see it. But you hedge your bets by registering a, um, a compensating action that's run if your parent aborts. And uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of activity uh, you know, studying uh, these kinds of, uh, uh, of things, you know, what you can do with them, working out examples. A lot of the examples have the same kind of flavor as the ones I've shown you, saying here's a, a data type where if you do it naively with read-write synchronization, you don't get enough concurrency. If you do it with open nested transaction, then behold, you get a lot more concurrency. So um, the, you know, I'm not a big fan of open nested uh, transactions because they're, I think they're kind of dangerous because it's just as easy to do something uh, incorrect as it is to do something correct. You know, so it's a very powerful, very flexible mechanism, but it's not a methodology. So, um, I mean, first complaint is that, uh, you know, you look at these examples and, you know, the ones that look correct don't look much different from the ones that aren't correct. And there's no real, you know, proof rules. Uh, the recent uh, proposals actually point out, well, there, you know, this particular program has a deadlock. If your compensating action has to, say, acquire locks, your compensating action is run as a transaction, but it can't be aborted, and it has to acquire locks to do things, or if it has to acquire locks to do things, and it can't get those locks, then you're stuck with a deadlock. Now, the whole purpose, the whole ideological drive behind uh, replacing locking with transactions is that you don't get deadlocks. You know, you can get live locks, but live locks are much easier to uh, handle with back offs and so on than deadlocks. But here we have deadlocks again. And there are also uh, all kinds of questions about what happens if the uh, child transaction modifies something that was read by the parent and then releases it to the outside world uh, and, and, and so on. Another um, problem is that uh, even though they're very powerful, there's things you can't do. So the transactions are nested, but you remember in the uh, skew heap example that I gave you at the beginning, we did uh, hand over hand uh, locking, where the intervals where you were holding the locks weren't nested. And uh, there are um, you know, lots and lots of uh, clever uh, data structures that are based on this kind of a lock uh, coupling. And uh, there's no obvious way to um, uh, do this in uh, open nested transactions. Also, you don't get the uh, fine grained thread interleavings unless you, move, unless you shrink your open transactions to basically the level of a single instruction. Uh, but then uh, what are you going to register a compensating action for each individual instruction to undo things? You know, 
doesn't uh, seem uh, convincing. Okay, um, that said, uh, transactional boosting isn't uh, necessarily going to solve all the world's problems because, as, as I said, you have to be able to recognize commutative operations. You have to have enough information to tell when things do and don't commute. You have to have inverses. And uh, these two requirements seem to work pretty well for collections classes, but uh, we have no idea whether they work uh, well uh, for anything else. You know, so if you're building a set or a heap or a hash table or a skip list, then you're probably okay. But uh, uh, beyond that, I'm not going to uh, claim anything. Okay, con my concluding uh, slide is that I think that uh, this, is, this whole uh, transactional uh, research is a very exciting uh, area uh, because it means we have to go back and rethink all kinds of things. I mean, everybody thought that the current data structures uh, were sort of uh, done a deal, but it uh, turns out that when you move them into a transactional uh, world, stuff that uh, you thought was settled uh, suddenly doesn't work anymore. And so uh, there's all kinds of um, work that needs to be done in order to uh, make all of these things uh, work, and it includes, you know, rethinking uh, older stuff, uh, re-stealing uh, old ideas, and, and applying them again in a new uh, context. And I uh, should have... I didn't change the bottom slide from the last time I used this, but this is a computer science kind of full employment act. So thank you. Yes. So what do you think about hardware proposals for the transaction memory? It seems like, from what you, I understood, it seems like you're focusing on software side. So I'm focusing on software here because, uh, you know, you can build software today, but, uh, you know, hardware implementations are kind of hard to, uh, to come by. So the question is, is, um, tran is transactional memory uh, more like virtual memory where it doesn't work if you don't have hardware? Or is it more like uh, garbage collection where you, we used to think you needed hardware but now recognize that we don't? And personally, I think that we do need a hardware uh, acceleration in order to get it to run fast enough. I mean, notice I didn't make any claims that things are going to run more efficiently under a transactional model. I made the claim that it's easier to use. And if you want, the, uh, my belief is that uh, what you're going to end up with is a kind of a hybrid uh, model where you have a software uh, superstructure, but the uh, ball bearings, the place where the performance really matters, will be done with some kind of a hardware. So I, so I think a hardware is uh, essential to uh, making this uh, program uh, work. I have a second second question, which is, uh, some time ago, the other similar technique, or at least it seems to me similar, which is called thread level speculation, was very popular, right? And at least in research community, but then it kind of faded. And well, the problem, problem is, is thre doing so thread level speculation is a great idea, but it was very, really hard to get that, to extract that kind of parallelism, so that uh, the... Uh, you could make it work correctly, but uh, it was hard to say, well, we're going to speculate this far and no further. Because if you speculate too far, you end up throwing everything out. You speculate not far enough. You don't uh, get enough parallelism. And I think the, uh, you know, that's the reason that that wasn't successful was really more of a narrow technical issue rather than uh, you know, being the wrong uh, kind of issue. And I think the, you know, here we, you, know, you have to write your transaction. If all your transactions conflict with one another, you're not going to get any speed up. But there wasn't any concurrency to be had uh, there uh, to begin with. So well, I don't think that this is going to go the uh, same way, but uh, you know, we'll see. Yeah, so you started out by saying that the solution to bloat was concurrency. Now the solution to the problem of concurrency seems to be uh, stuff that's at least as hard to uh, implement as uh, curing bloat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but the difference here is that uh, you know. We're, we're the people who are off writing these concurrent Java packages are, uh, you know, working in their kind of own little self-contained world. You know, we're taking this as a black box and building something else on top of it. So at least it's modular and it, and it composes. So the, the alternative is not neither modular nor, nor uh, composable. You know, I never said that everything would be easy, only that, uh, you know, by, by providing the right level of uh, modularity, we can uh, hire... Uh, know, smart uh, monomaniac uh, people to uh, write these, uh, you know, very clever data structures, and the rest of us can use them uh, with impunity. But you're having difficulty visualizing implementing all of this in a way that uh, doesn't solve the blood problem. The, uh, well, 
the, the bloat problem is, is uh, adding uh, new features that slow everything down. Now here, if, if you can exploit the concurrency, you can add the new features provided they're concurrent enough. And I haven't said anything about where you're going to find this concurrency. What I've said is if you find this concurrency, here's how to extract it uh, without going crazy uh, with uh, deadlocks and uh, conventions and, and things like that. So I haven't, uh, told, you know, I haven't solved all of your concurrency problems. I've just made it a little bit easier for you to solve your own concurrency problems. In the 1970s, Tony Hoare did a bunch of work on monitors. Uh, the only difference I see between here and monitors, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you have rollback. Is that, is that a true uh, assessment? Uh, well, you have, it's certainly related to a monitors, but monitors didn't live in this transactional uh, context. So, so you need to have rollback. You need to live, so you need to live in a system where other transactional objects aren't implemented with this methodology. So you have to, uh, one thing I haven't said is, uh, you know, if I have two transactional objects, can, you know, do they really compose? And the answer is uh, they almost always do, although you can come up with pathological cases when they don't. But basically, uh, this composes with any system where the order in which transactions commit is a valid serialization order. So th there, there's, um, th there's more to it than monitors, but clearly it, you know, it owes a lot, you know, as does you know, all, all work in the, uh, concurrency to, uh, to, to monitors and related ideas. This seems to lead to a model of concurrency where you discover that you have a conflict fairly late. Um, which creates problems if you're trying to distribute between non-shared memory machines. So th th this is set up for shared memory machines. And, the, one, and ones where locking between them works fairly fast. Uh, yeah, or, or, or something where, where communication between the threads is fast, whether it's locking or, or, uh, or other kinds of uh, uh, communication. If you, want to, if you want to go to non-shared memory machines, then you start talking about distributed uh, computing and you have two-phase commit protocols and uh, things uh, like that. So I think that you know, the mechanisms for moving from shared memory uh, transactions out to distributed transactions are, are pretty well understood, but that's not in some sense what I'm, what I'm addressing here. I'm assuming everybody's shares of memory, same coherence domain. There have been a lot of speakers in this series describing various kinds of non-shared memory kinds of machines. And uh, nobody seems to have a good software answer for them yet. Well, there are people who claim that CSP is the right answer uh, uh, for that. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not per personally uh, convinced of that. But uh, no, th this is very specifically uh, targeted toward, uh, toward the shared memory because for the time being, that's what um, your multicores are going to look like. You know, eventually, maybe the multicores will get too big to have uh, you know, uh, a shared coherence domain. Then we have to start talking about more complicated models. But I think this model will keep all of us uh, busy uh, for uh, you know, the next uh, decade. How does this interact with the underlying memory model? So um, there's two ways to answer that. Specifically, all of these Java classes use uh, compare and swap and locking. So they're all uh, sequentially consistent, uh, linearizable, and so on. The uh, broader answer is, uh, like all of these things, you, you had better understand what the underlying memory model is in order to make uh, uh, things work. So you know you, you, you better do uh, barriers and, and, and things like that in, in, in the right uh, places. You know there's there's no kind of magic uh, bullet uh, for that sort of stuff. You know the engineers that gave us these horrible models and we have to uh, uh, live with them for the for the time being. And, and the reason you need rollback um, in this model is because a transaction the model says a transaction can commit can abort at any time for any reason. It might abort because there's a deadlock. You know, it might abort be, if it's uh, if you're using a kind of a uh, pessimistic uh, scheme where you acquire you ask for permission before you touch something, then you can deadlock. If you're using an optimistic scheme, you could get to the end and uh, say, "Oops, you know, I just uh, read something that uh, I shouldn't have read. I have to roll back." So the underlying hardware may be faulty, or you you just don't know enough about the rest of the environment. You don't know enough about the rest of the environment. So you know, if, if, I, if I have a transaction that uh, reads X and writes Y, and you have a transaction that does uh, the things in the opposite order, then uh, really we can't run concurrently. But we don't, if you don't know that, then each of us could read a variable and try to write the other variable. And then a pessimistic scheme, you have a deadlock. An optimistic scheme, uh, you're going to have a friendly fire. Um. So the, the rollback is necessary to be defensive. <coughs> what is that going to require for um, programmers that are actually trying to well, the programmers don't necessarily have to see the rollback. 
So you can, you can just say atomic um, block, and underneath it does retries. And it can have, you know, back offs and all this clever stuff to uh, uh, manage the uh, contention. But from a programmer's point of view, you don't, all you need to know is that uh, this will happen eventually, you know, progress. And when it does happen, it looks like everything in the block happened instantaneously. And in some sense, that's the charm of the model, is that's all you need to understand as a programmer. The fact that it's using exponential back off or, something, or priorities underneath to make progress is, is something that you don't need to, uh, to know about at, at the programmer level. Priority assessment of the uh, performance. <laughs> the, the, uh, well, you know, it's like you don't need to know what kind of uh, locking uh, algorithm a Java uses when you say synchronized. You know, there's certainly, uh, you know, if you're doing, you know, real-time anti-missile system, then you probably do want to know. But if for the vast majority of applications, uh, you know, the, the existing runtime system will be good enough. Can you retrofit this to a Thomas? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I'm waiting for them to, uh, to bid uh, on it. Yeah. Aren't you afraid of reintroducing blocks again into transactional memory? Behave similar to open nesting? Uh, well, transactional so the original transactional memory proposal was optimistic, right? You, you, you sort of go through and then you uh, discover uh, conflicts in, in the hardware cache. But there have been a lot of proposals since then, uh, you know, based on locks that are, all that locking though is done down in the engine room where you don't see it. So the, pro the problems with locks are uh, having sort of normal mortal programmers using them. But it's perfectly okay if experts uh, do these things in uh, tightly sealed uh, black boxes. You know, in fact, anything that uh, said you, you can't hire an expert to do something, um, however uh, grungy, in a tightly sealed modular black box isn't a very good methodology. Uh, what's, what's important is not sort of what goes on underneath. It's the interface. That, uh, so, you know, so I'm not worried, but uh, uh, perhaps I should be. So, oh, I mean, for the Tomos, the Tomos author is not here, but as a second author, I guess I'll take up his, his uh, you know, mantle. Um, but what, so I find it odd that we, we're starting to depend on people who, who do our writing these sort of arcane black box models, right? Instead of saying, okay, we can use open nesting, even though it might be dangerous, we're still using it in a sort of under the hood way that's not necessarily exposed to the programmer. And we achieve simpler data structures than, say, WA's concurrent, you know, things. So I don't have to maintain that code. I don't even have to have it written. If I come up with some new data structure, it's sim more simpler to, to, you know, move into a transactional memory environment. But, I mean, so what, what is the disadvantage of that point of open nesting? I guess I, maybe if you could explain the disadvantages you have for open nesting in the previous couple of slides. So, so think about open nesting is, uh, so D Dugley's uh, code, however hard it may be to understand, guarantees that you get uh, fine-grained uh, interleavings of any two uh, threads that are using it. So it's not the case that, uh, you know, if one thread gets halfway through and blocks, the others are going to be stuck. You know, for open nested transactions, because they're transactions that have isolation, you don't get that granularity of interleaving. You know, it's got to be the case that if, if I'm going through the skip list in an open nested transaction, and so are you, they've got to be totally serialized. They can't uh, run uh, concurrently because, you know, that's the price you pay for having a really simple data structure is you get really simple uh, behavior. And if you don't care about that level of uh, concurrency, then maybe you'll be willing to uh, settle for that. But if you want to say, I want my transactions to have the same granularity of interleaving as my threads, then, uh, and uh, somebody else has already done the work to make this happen, then I don't see any reason why we shouldn't uh, be able to exploit it. But I mean, the problem is then it's the only thing that that's the difference. So I mean, if I have a mechanism to release long chains of dependencies, then release. Uh, you mean releasing the locks? Right. Oh yeah, but the, the locks have timeouts, and everything can be rolled back. No, no, I mean like, like an early release mechanism. Uh, uh, so, so early release, you know, as, as the uh, you know, one of the things I've always regretted is inventing early release. <laughs> and uh, early release works really well for the one particular linked list benchmark it was invented to uh, solve. And if you ever try to use it in a red black key or something, you'll go nuts. You know, it, it just it, it's doesn't, um, uh, doesn't work. If, um, you know, if you try to come up with proof rules for it, I'm sure you could, but it's, you know, very subtle, complicated, and mostly boring because it only works on this one uh, example. So I'm, I'm uh, you know, you know, I didn't uh, take the time to vilify early release too, but uh, early release is. Um, ah, okay. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, the 
He's the yeah, first time. I, I he's am here. actually here. You start off. I think we had a paper on transactional function classes, which is sort of similar to, to some of this work. And I think we, we showed in that, said in that paper that, we, well, you know, open nesting is sort of been vilified, maybe good or right or wrong. But in that paper, we said, look, if you use it in this structure, we would basically use the open nesting to maintain sort of the local state and to maintain sort of this abstract locking table. Um, that we actually just use closed nesting for the actual updates to the underlying data structure. And I think we would see similar improvements. You, we can still have sort of violations updating that, that shared structure. Uh, at the end of the at the end of the transaction, and if you used a concurrent uh, hash map or a concurrent data structure, you could reduce the violations there. So I think if you combine sort of what we were doing there, do the open nesting for the locking table, along with using sort of these high performance data structures, you get even more performance. You actually can get transactional boost, right? boost the performance by using these more concurrent uh, data structures under, underneath your transactional collection class. So. Okay, well, I think that would be very interesting to. I'd like to understand that better. Okay, well, thank you. What's a TV to you? <laughs> oh, a, a TV is uh, thread verification. That was a workshop. Uh, you know, it's sort of embarrassing, too. But, yeah. I'm sure nobody else ever reuses their slides uh, either. <laughs> yeah? I uh, must say that I'm uh, not terribly sanguine about experts being able to handle uh, these things, having uh, seen uh, the security problem professionally developed operating systems and uh, a number of other cases and seen a number of experts in concurrency say, well, that paper was wrong five, five years ago and here's a new paper explaining why. <laughs> well, no, nobody's perfect. Uh, that, yes. But security, I think, is harder. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying they require more formalism? Uh, that, that it's a bad thing that they require more formalism than the other things, or that uh, we should be doing more formalism? But you should be doing more formalism. That the the models with which we build these future machines, in particular. Well, the, oh, uh, the fact that we need more formalism isn't a criticism. It's truth. You know, of course, we do need uh, more uh, formalism, and uh, the. Um, oh, gratuitously. I mean, <laughs> sort of. Uh, <laughs> isn't that what the European? You mean rigor, yeah. not formal? Yeah, I mean, maybe more rigor. But I know, I mean, the use of more formal methods in, in, um, in building uh, machines with concurrency. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so here, for example, you want to use formal methods to show that, in fact, uh, your uh, things you thought were commutative really are. Uh, you want to show that an inverse really is an inverse. Uh, you could uh, do model checking, uh, for example, uh, to, uh, to, to test a lot of these uh, things. And certain properties, desirable properties of programs, uh, in, which we don't do at all today in conventional operating systems. Uh, proof of deadlock freedom, for example. Um, well, typically, um, it's hard to prove something is deadlock free if it does anything interesting. You know, so, you know, so, so most interesting pop things are a deadlock uh, prone, and, and you, re you would rather recover from the deadlock rather than prove it can't happen in the first place. But that's a quibble. You know, I, I, I agree that uh, we need, uh, you know, if we had better formalism, then we would all be uh, better off. And I'm certainly not uh, going, you know, a as a theoretician, I'm not going to uh, dis uh, formalism. So how does the poor visual basic programmer decide where to put the begin transaction in Ah, Is there any guidance there? I was hoping no one would ask that. Uh, that <laughs> the, uh, it's, it's basically, s mostly it's obvious, sometimes it isn't. But uh, I think you're better off uh, right, putting begin end transaction than lock and unlock. Uh, My argument that is this just an art that you, you, your program's too slow so you move it in closer to each other? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, the, uh, I think, you know, if people are tempted to do that, uh, they will uh, get what they deserve. You know, in some sense, and and that's I mean, you see that sort of thing with locks as well. You know, uh, you know, d d d double check locking and things like that. Performance debugging. You throw, you get a, a race condition. You throw in more locks until the race condition went away, and then it was too slow. So you started taking them out, and you got the race condition. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the optimization. Uh, the yeah, no, I think that I mean that sort of thing isn't uh, going to uh, go away. So I, I'm not uh, selling uh, you know snake oil or magic bullets. You know, just incremental uh, improvements. 
So any more uh, questions? Thanks. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.